There's a complex in El Scano at 770 West Imperial, it's 100 units. It was 70% renters. So when I was door knocking, asking them if they wanted to sell, you know, half the people were slamming the door in my face, the Same. other ones told me to go away. Don't you know I rent? And they didn't tell me that they rented, they just said, don't bug me or call me. And when I came back, Mike said, oh, I knew they were renters, but I figured that if you can handle this 100 units, then one at a time's a little easier. If you can get rejected seven out of 10 times, you'll be on your way. Right? There's a little more than that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Diggs Influencer Podcast, the titans of real estate. The show that provides direct access to the real estate industry's top movers and shakers as they share invaluable insight on how to best navigate and succeed in any market. I'm your host, Warren Dow, founder and CEO of M3 Media and publisher of Diggs Magazine. In this episode, Bill Ruain. Thank you to our show sponsor, Bo Concept. Today, we welcome to the Diggs Influencer Podcast, the number two REMAX agent in California and the number two REMAX agent worldwide, who consistently ranks as one of the top producing agents in the country. Welcome to the show, Bill Ruane. Thank you, Warren. And thanks for taking the time to have this interview. Before we get into your backstory, Bill, I want to jump right into real estate. You're truly a case study success story in focusing and dominating a niche community in real estate, in your case, El Segundo. Was this always your plan to focus on a single community? No, I just fell into that as far as I worked public relations for Embassy Suites for one year, and that got me into all the companies on how many companies were in El Segundo, and then expanding from there into real estate. So that was in El Segundo? Correct. Okay. They had just opened up at the time. Okay, gotcha. And you have an interesting mix of business, different from most realtors, in the sense that they either focus on residential, single family, correct, or commercial, or multifamily kind of units. And you, you have a true mix of all three. Absolutely. So tell us, was that, again, part of the plan, or was that, did you buy that, so that after, It was mainly residential, was okay. my goal. And then you found out that people who owned residential, they also owned commercial, and they still you know, wanted to work with you on both. And so you were, I don't want to say forced into it, so a compliment. So one, one led to the other? One led to the other, and then all of a sudden, the different personalities, commercial sellers versus residential sellers. Yeah. A lot less emotion in the commercial side, a lot less thinking as far as what you put the sales price at. It's absolutely numbers on the commercial, while residential side, it's a lot more you know, what the property looks like, what's mm-hmm. the decorations like, a lot of the more cosmetic as well as location on, on both is number one, obviously. So interesting. So you really have to understand... Obviously, the subject matter in terms of what asset class it is, but also sort of what are the motions and sort of psychology behind those those assets. Just like you said, it's interesting. They're different. Correct. They're they're completely different, and you got to be able to switch to that personality immediately. You know, just as, as far as when you're talking residential people in general, including myself, you have to spend a lot more time with them because it's it's a big part of their financial portfolio. Mm-hmm. And then on the commercial side, it's purely. It's a business decision that they're moving or selling or leasing. What's your business mix typically on the, along those three, residential, commercial? It was 48.52 last year and about 40.60 the year before, residential being number one. See, it's good that you know those numbers. Yeah, it was, it's uh, funny because a lot of the top agents that I speak to, I ask like, what was your volume last year? How many trades? They're like, I don't know. I think it was around this. You know, They know how much money they made? Right. Always exactly, but, the, but how it led to that, or what led to it, what the mix? They don't know. That's funny. Good, you know, you know your numbers. So, how has the El Segundo market changed since you first started selling real estate there? You know, it, it, the East Side Sepulveda was not really developed that well until the last probably the last ten to fifteen years. Now, El Segundo has the second most Fortune five hundred companies in California, apart from San Francisco. So, we have a lot more businesses. We have a lot more people coming in here from out of the area. While well, before it was predominantly. Else got no kids growing up, condos, house. And then again, it was just families from uh, local cities coming into El Segundo. Gotcha. So, so let me ask you a question, kind of a different one. Why, why do you think most real estate agents fail? A lot of uh, realtors come here after their, uh, as their second job. You know, they might be coming in their, their 50s, 60s, or 70s after they're done with their first job. And I think they're used to that nine to five type of hours, weekends off. It's completely the, different nowadays. And then more and more, 
you have companies like you know Raytheon, Boeing, Mattel. They're not real keen on you taking off a couple hours for lunch to go look at homes or or making personal calls, you know, during working hours as they shouldn't. So now you adjust your hours to more, you know, four o'clock in the afternoon till eight o'clock at night. Weekends are going to be a lot more a lot more detailed as far as your scheduling with people for buyers. Interesting. It's definitely a full time. The ones that make it and prosper are full time. They're fully vested, fully invested. They're all in. No shortcuts. And, and that's yeah. And that's it. Okay. What advice would you give a new agent getting started today? So let's say they're into sports and uh, they want to be a realtor. That's common. Mm-hmm. But try and see it for one month before they do anything. Not to watch any sports on Sunday. Because I think for the rest of their career, Sundays will be open houses and we're dealing with buyers. So if they can't handle that, they probably won't quite make Man, it in, they the, can. <laughs> in the real estate. That's a good perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how do you personally differentiate yourself from the competition? Like, what's your, you know, secret, unique? My competitors or my, when I say competitors, I, I think we're all kind of have the same goal. We have different niches. Mm-hmm. But I don't know any of them who don't answer their own phone, number one. And always are you know, available from nine o'clock till nine o'clock, seven days a week. I, I haven't found a trick of someone doing uh, eight to five, like I mentioned. There's no one doing that and being number one. So let's talk about how you got into real estate. When did you get started? What what year was it, and how? Tell us a little bit, a little bit about that. So I, I was working at MSC Suites Hotel at the time, and uh, that was in El Segundo, public relations. But it was basically six days a week, probably 60, 70 hours a week. A great career to to learn, to teach, to as far as work ethic. Then I was introduced to a couple of different people in real estate, as well as there was a friend of mine growing up, Brian Bralin. His dad was in real estate. And so we were always at his office. So all of a sudden it became innate because we've always been in a real estate office, even though both my parents were doctors, the medical profession was not an option for me by due to my education. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, that's how I got basically pushed into it by admiring the people in the industry. And it was comfortable when you were in there just sort of hanging out and going, hey, this is something I could do and correct, figure out. You liked it. You know, it was just kind of a, it was local. There was no traveling. You know, the, the positive sides of it. And you, you started in El Segundo, right? Correct. Okay. So tell me about your first sale. What was your first sale? There was a house for rent and I called them to see if they wanted to sell their house on Candy Cane Lane, in fact, in El Segundo. And that was a, my first home sale was there. And also my third home sale was on that same street. Oh, wow. So... They both were interested in selling their house rather than renting it. At the time, they could not rent it. So it was just a, it was just a fluke. It was just timing. So what year was that? Uh, 89. 89, okay. Well, interesting, back to realtors and knowing their numbers. A lot of them don't know their numbers, but they all know the answer to that question. Their first house that they sold. Yeah. They know the address. They know the story. <laughs> it's like clockwork. What's been your biggest sale thus far in your career? Probably commercial? Commercial, the house and hotel, which was on Sepulveda. Okay, yeah. wow. That, it was so, a 650-room hotel. Wow. 600, I'm sorry, a, a 605-room hotel. The, the corner of Mariposa? And, and, okay. Exactly. Wow. What's the, what was the price? That, you, was, that was $25 million. Well, you think it would be more for yeah. something that big. And it was interesting because it was five acres of land. But again, it was an old hotel, and but a lot of rooms. And who bought that? It was sold twice since then. Oh, wow. And what about the place? I, we used to go hang out there way back when. It's got the huge parking lot. The old sports bar. Oh, the Stickenstein. Old... Yeah, Stickenstein. So What's that's that? 707 Sepulveda. So that's going to be a 116-room hotel. It's oh, it going to be a boutique hotel, non-union. It's someone in San Marco who owns quite a few hotels. And I think he's going to do a kind of a unique job with this one. Wow. So they're, they're definitely looking at putting hotels. It's a, it's a good corridor there, right? To, Correct. Because right of there? the employment. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. As we hit on early when I introduced you, I mean, you've won every major award and recognition at REMAX that there is pretty much. Correct. So did you have a mentor early on in your career or someone at Remax or that you learned the business from or you've tried to shadow and you... Mike Collins, who worked for Shorewood Real oh, yeah. Estate. I know Mike. Great, right. great guy. Yeah. He worked for Remax my first year. An incredible teacher. I mean, he, he made me read books, read more then than I did in college <laughs> and door knocked. You know, it was basically he uh, disciplined me. Real estate agents in general are not disciplined. They're mm-hmm. kind of a, a different personality. They want freedom. But if you're not structured, and he taught me structure, I was not that person who had structure. Mike Collins had sent me to door knock, which is the one thing realtors 
just absolutely despised doing. <laughs> and he knew that that was one way to get out there. There's a complex in El Escano at 770 West Imperial. It's 100 units. At the time, I did not know it. It was 70% renters. So when I was door knocking, asking them if they wanted to sell, you know, half the people were slamming the door in my face. The Same. other ones told me to go Don't away. Don't you know I rent? <laughs> and they didn't tell me that they rented. They just said, "Don't bug me or call me," or just so I wouldn't call their owner. That was a tough experience, but it was. Well, it was a good learning. It was a great learning experience. And when I came back, Mike said, "Oh, I knew they were renters, but I figured that if you can handle this hundred units, then one at times a little easier." If you can get rejected seven out of ten times, you'll be on your way. Right? There's a little more than that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> was he the biggest influence, you think, and like most impact? Or was there another person downstream that... There was Bob Branlin was one of the biggest ones, and Mrs. Young. They were both real estate agents as I was growing up. And also Olga Benson, who, whose son is in charge of all of her properties now, and they're just a great family. Awesome. So let's go into your backstory. Take us back. So you grew up in the South Bay. Correct. El Segundo. El Segundo. Okay. What was life like back then? What did you do for fun as a youth? And what, how was El Segundo back then? Oh, El Segundo, especially their main street, was pretty much the same. I mean, we don't have the, didn't have the Rock and Brews and uh, Brewport and uh, El Segundo Brewing Company. It's still a lot more stores. It's funny because west side of Sepulveda is still 1960s, closes at 9 o'clock. You know, east side of Sepulveda is 2050, way ahead of its time. Just a kind of amazing dichotomy. Wow. So both your parents were, were physicians? Were Correct. Doctors? Where'd they grow up? My dad had a physician's office in, in Hawthorne. He died when I was 18. My mom's still alive, and she worked for LA County Schools. Okay, good deal. So what, what were some of the favorite things when you were young? What, what did you do? Did you, did you go, were you a beach guy? Did you go surfing? No, it was predominantly bike riding. You know, okay. It was just a big thing, because we had, it wasn't too long ago that you still had vacant fields, including Elevon, which was just built five oh, yeah. years ago. Oh, yeah. We're all vacant fields, and you just bike ride out there, you know, just there was... There's nothing out there. Yeah. So that was predominant things. You know what I mean? Well, it's yeah. funny you say that because I grew up in Westlake Village, California, and uh, we moved there in 1970, 1969, 70, and there was no lake in Westlake. And it was literally the same thing. All the developments that, like on Westlake Boulevard now, there was, it was all empty fields. And we used to, my sister and I used to fly kites and bikes, and you could walk forever, and there was, no, there was nothing. Correct. Now you go back and it's just like, there's development everywhere, every nook and cranny. And, and nothing bad about that. Just yeah. a, it's just, it was a different time. Yeah. You know, you know Westlake back then was not on anyone's radar. My parents chose to live there because my dad worked in like Midtown, Vermont, Midtown, LA. And he didn't want to live in the city. He wanted, you know, so it was back then there was no traffic. It was a, you know, 35, 40 minute straight shot, straight shot down, down the freeway. And then when it, traffic and the more development it turned into an hour then an hour and a half and it's like okay <laughs> it's not hitting anymore so when you're going to school did you have did you want to be something specific when you grew up did you have any like hey i'm going to be you know an x y or z like did you have a career a aspiration when you were young i think you know we all want to be a paramedic you know that type of thing that was probably the closest you ever wanted to be you know yeah. as far as medical mm -hmm. and again that was something that was just a phase didn't do anything with it didn't do anything trying to achieve it i just Thought it'd be kind of a great job. And then, then you also want to get into politics, but politics and real estate usually don't go hand in hand. <laughs> More divisive than united. Yes, church and state. And yeah, there's two, two things that they should never talk about, right? Correct. Religion and politics. Keep it vanilla. <laughs> <laughs> Neutral as you can be. <laughs> so we talked about your, your first gig before getting into real estate, but when you were, when you were young... What'd you do? Did you deliver pizzas or would you do anything like... You know, I worked at a... Uh, you became real popular because I, I actually worked at Straw Hat Pizza in Ladera Heights and also had, worked at a liquor store. Okay. So in high school, working at a liquor store, you, you were the popular kid. Yeah. I was like, hey, Bill, possibly hook, obvious hook me reasons. up. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about a significant event or time in your life that changed you or set you on a different path. Was there a moment, like we call them aha moments, and they can be good or bad, like through pain and suffering or other like is there a moment that you remembered that cemented sort of your journey kind of ironic of all my career times it was ironically last year and most people don't even know it but i had a uh, a minor surgery that went went sideways wow and so that morning next thing i know i was in a uh, hyperbaric chamber at long beach hospital and here i thought it was just a minor thing and then the uh but i knew when the doctor was calling me at 11 o'clock at night to tell me i had to go in, in the morning she was pretty concerned obviously got me concerned it was going to be five times I was going to be in that uh, chamber. And have, being claustrophobic doesn't help anybody. It had been 19 times of an hour and a half in a chamber, and it's just bill time. 
You know, just your time to think. Mm -hmm. And you don't realize you don't have that time because I live for distraction. You, you got so much going on yeah. and here you are in a tube. And probably the worst thing, best thing ever happened to me. It wasn't fun, I won't say that. But toward the end, it's kind of stages of death. You accept it and you grow from it. And it was an incredible motivator because I have no desire to be that guy who wants to retire or that guy who just wants to sit around and just doing nothing. And that's why I felt like I was doing it for an hour and a half each day. Well, so re-energize you and give re you kind you of and, uh, focus back on purpose. Exactly. Yeah. Kind of was a positive event, even though it was a scary event at the time. So, wow, that's that's an amazing story. And here you are, better than ever, so that's good. Right. Um, it, was, it was incredible. Yeah, it was uh, absolutely. And, and it's funny because the surgeon there had a great sense of humor and said, you know, you have celebrities paying thousands of dollars to go into this chamber. And, you know, here you get it free with insurance. And I, <laughs> I said, I don't want to... I still don't want to do it, even if it's free. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, something from that, I mean, and, and this is sort of work-life balance, but and I found, you know, I used to be a CEO of a, of a big company, and, and there was so much distraction and so much going on day and night and emails and phones and meetings, and you could never get clarity of thought unless you were sort of forced away. And for me, it was like on airplanes. Right. And I had an over-an-hour commute, which was very, I would try not to use my phone to work, you know, if I could help it. Right. Just to think. Um, sometimes just no music, just just silence. Just like let your brain actually do something totally different, like no stimulation, so you can think. It's sort of radical, isn't it? Like the, right. in today's and, day and age. And when you realize that you know for thirty years you're you're on the phone, you're texting and everything else, and you know you're, you're up to about 100, 110 phone calls a day, and probably at least that amount in texting. So you're constantly distracted and you're not focused even on life. Yeah. And not in a bad way, just a, you're focused on work. You yeah. know, and which again, I know you, you hear these speeches all the time about, you know, when you die, you don't say, God, I wish I worked more. But in some ways, if you didn't work more, you wouldn't have the quality of life that you did have. Yeah. And you need a purpose too. You need to like, right. if you don't, I think where people get in trouble and where life can be especially difficult is when you don't have a purpose. Exactly. And, and nothing's driving you, you know, and just simple work can be a good purpose and driver. I mean, you know what I mean? There's something satisfying about Plow in the field, like, and having a set schedule and doing whatever you're doing. And there's something... Because yeah, retirement, I mean, maybe there's people that have a, have a goal with it, and that's part of the 10%. You know, they want to retire, you know, and just go camping, traveling, and everything. I think those people are well set. Some people, I think that they're not made to retire. And I think I'm definitely one of those people. My dad's one, too. Right. It's just he, not yeah. a... <laughs> he, and, and he's selling real estate now, and he's 80, and he's still selling. He's up in Payson, Arizona. He was a CEO, worked his whole life, same kind of thing. And when he retired, he was. there's no way you can go from that level of sort of being busy and, and occupied to nothing. It's, right. it's a dangerous place. It's a lonely place. And one of his best friends, poor guy, developed Alzheimer's. He sold his company. It was kind of a similar story. They grew up best friends. He's still alive, but he's he's suffering from, you know, Alzheimer's. He sold his company. He made made his money. He lives on, he's got a home, home on Malibu Beach Road. He's got, you know, and he worked his whole life for that. And then when he retired, his brain literally shut down. And so you look, your whole life's work. Right. And then you can't even remember who you are or what, what you're doing. It's crazy. So I'm a firm believer in keeping an active mind. Inactive is, you know, what's the other term for it? Idle hands, you know? It, idle brain maybe is... <laughs> is probably a better word, exactly. You know what I mean? Idle, idle brain is, is not... And the one thing about real estate, it's similar to teaching. You know, if you get handicapped or impaired, you can still do both. I mean, yeah. I'm, and believe me, teachers have a lot more more use than, than realtors do for the general public. So they're both amazing jobs as far as having that ability to be impaired and still being able to do your job. Yeah. Let's talk about real estate you know, more getting your insights and intel. What are some of the most common myths you think in real estate that you can debunk for our audience? So I think one of them is that, you know, that's how you make your millions in real estate. Well, that's how most people made their millions is in real estate, but it's also timing. You could have bought in 08 and basically the next year you're 25% negative in your home sales. So you want to make sure you do your research on the area, the city, even if you don't have kids, to make sure the school district's number one, make sure you have a good police and fire department, mm -hmm. make sure it's just a solvent area that you're looking into and treat it like a business, not just the, this home looks great. You, know, you could buy a, a home in Nebraska that's $20,000, but there's no employment. Yeah. So you're always going to be worth $20,000 and your retirement's not going to look that great. Yeah, that's it's going to be funny because you're skipping ahead. My next question was going to be, what I see, you know, and I'm sure you see it all the time, real estate consumers fall into the prey, sort of the thinking, you know, what I call stock stock market mentality when it comes to buy or sell. They wait, you know, 
And timing is important, obviously, but you can't, no one controls timing. And people try to do that, just like they do in the market, you know? And it's, you know, what are your thoughts on this? Trying to, when you're advising clients and they're saying, is it a good time or bad time? And, you know, it's about timing. What, do you, what are your thoughts on that? And good time or bad time, it depends if they're investment property or their uh, primary home. Mm-hmm. Because you have to live somewhere. And if they're going to waste the money on rent, then anytime is a good time to buy because anything's better than renting for your own purpose. But as far as investment property, I think that's more strategy. That's trying to see you know what what's coming in the area, what's going to help the market grow, and what areas have rent control, what areas don't have rent control, because that also limits your upside on the property you're going to buy. Good advice. And speaking of advice, what's the single best piece of advice you would give a seller today? So before they sell, make sure that they have an, a plan for the next step. What do they plan to do once they sell? Do they have a place that they're, they've already bought? Is there an area they've already bought? I mean, that, again, going back to your timing and making sure it's a wise decision. If they're not familiar with an area they're moving to, maybe they rent the house they're in now and then rent where they're going and see if they still want to move a year later. If they still want to make a move a year later, then they've thought it out. How about market conditions? How, how heavily do they weigh into your consultations with buyers and sellers? Like, in terms of like, well, then we're coming up on a, maybe another real estate cycle. It's going to slow down. What should I do? I mean, with the South Bay, we tend to have a lot of relocation and relocation is year round. While most areas have, you know, summertime, you sell, you know, wintertime, you buy. We don't seem to have that cycle as much as everyone else. And El Segundo, by the way, enormous price gains in the last seven to 10 years. Especially our commercial, which, yeah. uh, which again, more affects so? our residential. Yes. Yeah. The Smoky Hollow, you know, less than 10 years ago was $200 a foot. Now it's creeping up on five and $600 a foot. And is there still growth? So is, it, is, is that still, is it fair valued, undervalued, overvalued? What do you think? Well, when I say it's fair valued, it's just a great little area. And instead of being in like Venice or, or Mar Vista or Inglewood, as far as your commercial area, you have a small little city and you have walking distance to 50 restaurants. And I don't think you get that in the uh, larger areas. So speaking of Inglewood with a new stadium going on? Has El Segundo gotten any benefit yet? Any sort of cross trickle down benefit from from that investment yet? Not really, and I, I would think that we would have. It's really helped Hawthorne, I think, because that's a budding city. More of the price range, probably Hawthorne and Inglewood. I do think Inglewood did a, and I'm not a rent control person, but I do think they did a, a wise move on doing an emergency rent control that they limit the amount five or seven percent a year, because you had people living in their apartments for. You know, 20, 30, 40 years, and now the apartment building's doubled in price. Mm-hmm. Well, now that you bought the price, now you have to have these people move because they can't afford it. So it's a really uh, balancing act on that side. But a lot of those people moved to Hawthorne more than El Segundo Man Beach. On the other hand, I should believe that it should be up to an individual city, not the state, to control rent control. And those cities should make their own decisions based on their demographics, their environment, and economic standing. The commercial market in El Segundo, again, is it how much growth is there left? Because, I mean, there's been so much growth. You know, Avalon, there's so many, like, new buildings, new infrastructure. What? Well, the Raytheon property, which is a park on El Segundo Boulevard and Sepulveda slash PCH, mm-hmm. is 144 acres, and that's now being rezoned for commercial high-rise and retail. So that's a huge chunk of land wow. that's being developed now. Is there any big parcels left, I mean, to that's, develop? That's the biggest one. And again, it was a park. So it's not like it's taken down a high-rise to build a high-rise. You have an area of land that was always vacant for, you know, since the beginning of time, yeah. you know, as far as being a park. And then there's eight acres on aviation and imperial. That's going to be, a, I think that's going to be like a campus of some type. Very cool. And then you got the new Lakers, obviously, training facility. Right. And the LA Times, you know, he, he's a great guy. He's trying to get the cure for all cancers, which is amazing, not just one cancer. He's adopted El Segundo, or we adopted him. I'm not sure which one came first, but just a very supportive person for the city. Well, interesting you say that, because I was at one of the Economic Council or Development dinners, right. and I got to hear him speak. And we should, for the audience, Patrick Soon Shung. He's done some incredible things and in part owner of the Lakers, now LA Times, uh, huge in medical. And and it's funny that you say that El Segundo was adopted. And I think people, a lot of people that get exposed to El Segundo, they fall in love with El Segundo. Right. It's still this sort of, I don't know how you describe it. It's like amazing it, charm. You know, just yeah, to, charm. And it's just, it's you feel like you're, you want to support it and be. It almost feels like a perpetual up and comer, even though it's not. Right. You know what I mean? Exactly. But that's a good thing. Yeah. That's, it's that's, a, people want to like, you know. And if you go down Main Street, within within one year, you know who lives in El Segundo, who doesn't live in El Segundo. It's, kind of, it's a big high school. It's a very small area. 
Yeah, when I first drove, drove through there, I called it Mayberry. I mean, it was like going back in time, right. Main Street, and in a good way. Exactly. In a good way. Looking for a personal stylist for your home? Check out Bow Concept. One of their design consultants can help you make the most out of your space. No request is too big or small for living, dining, sleeping, home office, and outdoor spaces. And check out their Southern California showrooms in Orange County and Costa Mesa and also in Los Angeles and La Brea. For more information, visit Bow Concept at bowconcept.com. Email info at bowconcept.la. It's funny because, I, like I said, I went to St. Bernard's and Loyola Marymount and different cities, you know, they, and, and they're not bad cities, just in El Segundo, you still see the people eye contact when they're walking and they say hi. It's, no one's looking down on the ground. No one's trying to avoid you. Mm-hmm. It's very much a, a, just a very outgoing people. Yeah, that's great. And in today's day and age, it's, that's more important than ever. Correct. Small town community, nice, happy people. <laughs> right, exactly. So let's go back to... Bill, in some of your numbers, you're the stealth, you know, bomber, as I was saying, in terms of like, people know you, you're, you're a huge name in this industry, but some of the volume that you do is, is mind blowing. Can you speak to, do you know your, your like lifetime sales number? This is a quiz, so I hope you, yeah, this is a, <laughs> I don't know how many sales I've done you know, in my entire years. But it's got to be at least way over a billion, right? Two billion? At least that, because yeah. like I said, it's a, you have some big sales because you do commercial and residential. But you average over 100 million in sales pretty much every Correct. year, right? Exactly. Yeah. So that, that's a huge number. Huge. Yeah. And it's funny because you, you don't think about the numbers. And again, going back to how I was trained, the person buying or selling their $350,000 condo or the hotel, they're still the same phone call. They're still the same amount of time on the phone. There's no priority as far as like a, who gets to be first, who's second because of the price level. And that's what I was taught. I found out that's more important than anything else. So you probably don't even know this. I just, I don't know why I just thought of this now, but you and I spoke on the phone probably even before I launched Digs. when I was looking at either, you know, investing or something in commercial or whatever. I, I used to, I called you a few times. Oh, okay. And you, this is before we knew each other, right? Yes. What I remember is just what you said in the beginning, you always picked up the phone. And if you couldn't talk, you said, I'll call you right back. And you always called me right back. And that's, that's a huge, in this business, it's huge. Right. Versus, I know a lot of people kind of do the email and they feel emailing is just as easy as, you know, you're just as good as grabbing or, the or phone. Or let my, my assistant call you back. Right. And uh, I think people who do a lot more emailing and less you know, talking are probably not going to make it in the industry just because of the personality behind it and the person behind it. And it doesn't show real effort for me to email you versus picking up the phone and calling you back. Yeah. You've been with Remax since day one, right? Exactly. Moving around in real estate is not something I'd recommend. Yeah. We're, we're a dime a dozen. So if you remember me selling your house and I worked for Remax and I and you look me up and I'm not with Remax anymore, I don't know how much of an effort you're going to go see where I am today. You know. Mm-hmm. So what do you think of all this consolidation that's going on? And it's starting to creep into the South Bay now with Compass. You've heard of Compass, obviously. And Palm Realty. They're, yeah. they're all good companies. They're all led by great people. And again, it, it forces you to improve yourself. It's not... It shouldn't be taken as a threat to any other real estate company or to any real estate agent, but you look and see what they're doing, see if they're doing something that you should be doing and improving yourself. There's been a ton of investment, billions and billions, tens and tens and tens of billions of dollars, and it's growing. It's not getting smaller in, in what they call real tech or prop tech or the, whatever name you want to throw on it. But it's basically the, the technology that's getting this business and this model more direct to consumer. So you've heard of the iBuyer phenomenon and all that. You got Zillow now with iBuyers and Open Door. You have the discount brokerages, Redfin, Purple Bricks. And so there's this continual investment and advancement and leveraging of technology. And now with blockchain and what have you, they're basically trying to cut out the middleman, which is the real estate agent. Yeah. There's a nice, clever term they use in making for industries when they say we're making it more efficient. And efficiency means someone's either losing their job or right. it, they're reducing dollars somewhere in the chain. Exactly. What are your thoughts on how this is playing out? We, we've always had that. And then when the market turns around and it's a bad market, those companies tend not to be around. Help You Sell was around when I first started. And then the market crashed and then you found yourself, you know, I'm spending $10,000 a month on marketing. And it's not just social media, which is predominantly free. You need to do the hard marketing, mm. which is newspapers, the Diggs promote, Magazine. Diggs Magazine <laughs> was a great example, by the way. And, uh, uh, and, and those, those really work. And I don't think these tech firms or the social media without the agent doing real estate is the answer. I think you still have a person behind it. And especially 
we're not car salesmen. Like your car is your car. You know what the 2020 BMW will be. Well, cars and homes, I think, are completely different. I think there's a lot more that goes to it, especially with disclosures, disclosure issues, and the amount of forms we have that we need these days. Basically, I, on the marketing ability and marketing strategies, I do a lot of print, media the four color, and it's more expensive than the most, but it's the most bang for your buck, and it absolutely gets the product out there in a, in a more long-term way. I know a lot of people use social media and they go on listing appointments and saying, you know, look, this is all the social media we do and we expose it to the world. But a lot of of ways, social media is immediate, it's rapid, it's not tangible, and it's also free. And that's why most agents use it. And they're not using the real effective way of the print media, which is something I've used and I found it very successful in my business. Or I wouldn't use it because it is expensive. So Bill, funny, you you talk about print media, having spent you know, a large part of my professional life in print media. This is a, a fun and sensitive sort of topic for me. What's funny and, and a bit ironic is, you know, because the marketing, everything has changed and, and you know, with digital and, and online, everyone's sort of been forced, you know, the mindset of the mentality forced between this or that, meaning print or digital, this or that. And it's a total false question and false narrative. It's neither this nor that. It's it's both. It's, it's marketing. Perfect. That's a great way to put it. I think a lot of times when people are at listing appointments and they say, oh, we do the social media and it's implied you can either do one or the other. While in fact, I do both just for obvious purposes. And again, the social media is something that Remax does and it's worldwide. It's fantastic, but it's not as effective as the print media. You know, doing this as long as I have, you know, the results and where you get the results and where you get the calls. Well, the good news for you, and if you look at any local digs type, real estate centric, hyper local media product, like we put out, you're going to see one thing consistently. All the top agents are using it on a consistent basis. Why? Because it works. It's an investment that pays pays dividends. And just like real estate is local, when you have a, a dominant share of voice in a single conversation, which is real estate and you dominate that as a marketing channel locally, it's your best bang, period. But everyone's chasing the digital euphoria of the day. That's gonna be to your benefit by staying slow and steady wins the race and local print is here to stay. Exactly, and that's a great point. There's nothing wrong with following the top agent and what they do. I see the agents in the, the South Bay that I admire and, I, and they're doing print media and you find out what print media they're doing. For example, Diggs or, or other local newspapers and they're sharp enough to know where their marketing dollars are, are coming through. Just a closing thought on that. You've got to go in marketing. There's a, there's a saying, you know, where's the attention being paid? And in real estate, if you're a realtor and you're trying to build your business and you, it's so competitive, there's 5,000 plus agents running around the South Bay alone. And you're vying for attention, you know, each and every day, each and every week. Why try to create that demand from scratch by yourself? Why not go where the attention's being paid, i.e. like a Diggs magazine, where that conversation is already fluid. It's already happening. It's already robust. Correct. Go there and join that conversation versus trying to create your own. It drives me bananas. People are like, I don't do print anymore. And I always say, do you, do you do marketing anymore? Of course I do marketing. Well, so why are you throwing out a channel? Like, what, I don't get how you can just completely cut the limb off of one channel. Right, right. Like, it just never existed or doesn't work. Like, what does that mean exactly? And when you take them through the, what's your objective? Because it all comes down to, okay, who are your customers? Who are your potential customers? They're buyers or sellers, right? Right. You have two kinds, buyers or sellers or renters. Where are they? Where do they live? They live in local communities. Right. Okay. So start there. Keep it simple. If you have a, find a way to effectively communicate with those two or three individuals in the geography you want on a frequent basis, isn't that a wise investment for your business? No, it's not. Like, yeah. what? And I, I'm an advocate for, for realtors and, and it's like, I don't exist without you. I really don't. There's no Bill Ruane of the world, but the Bills of the world, there's no digs. And part of the reason I got into this and started this whole thing was to try to, to elevate and create, simplify and, and firm up sort of what I call the last mile With all this technology and all this, you know, encroachment and trying to get rid of the realtor with technology and, you know, these people, the real estate's local. I mean, and 
just imagine all the streets and th- go to Smoky Hollow. Like right. each street, Penn is so different than the next one right, versus arena. like what the rent and like how do you transfer that into a computer algorithm or or when you're actually on the streets and and you know who the the history is and this and that. So and going back to the Zillow for example, you get all excited that your home's worth one point five million dollars. In reality, it's worth one point one. Zillow's not giving you false information. It's just the information they have, which is the bedrooms, the bathroom, square footage. But it depends on the location in that city, yeah. which, you know, you could be on a major highway, but that is not factored in. Well, and also there's, you know, 20, 25% sales are off market. And those off markets, either they're public, they, they get on the MLS or they don't. And they can greatly affect valuations per neighborhood or street. If someone comes in and goes, I want to live here. Right. I don't care what, it, what the price is. It may not even be for sale. Go give Joe an offer for his house. I want to live on that corner lot. Exactly. And if it was market value was two million, and Joe wanted to play three million, you know what I mean? That right. doesn't get incorporated in the system. It's just like no, you got to know that Joe that that house and so the whole history behind it. And and we have the condominium complex called Pacific Sands, which are conversion apartments. The only ones in our city. Again, if too many of those sell in a period, it brings down the condo sales that are not the real condos as far as what they were built as condos, you know, two bedrooms, two bath, two car parking, not apartment conversions with one car parking, no fireplace, washer and dryer is not an option. You know, those type of factors. Correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't El Segundo, didn't the median home price serve for single family? Did it hit 2 million last year? Or not the medium, no. I would say the medium is 1.5 million. 1.5, okay, Correct. for single family? Yes. Okay. But we've had quite a few $2 million sales, which... You know, it's still remarkable because it, it's gone up so... It's doubled at, at least, right? Exactly. And it's a lot of people from Playa Vista, Plato Ray, and Westchester. Once the school age, you know, the high school mm-hmm. age, that's where they start coming to El Segundo, Manhattan Beach. Because LA City schools are just a different type of school district. What's the record sale for El Segundo again? Has it hit the $3 million for a single family? There was a $3 million home that sold on Maple Street. Okay. But it was a 20,000 square foot lot. Going back to your point is that that's something that may not have been brought out in mm-hmm. the, as far as stats. How many, there's not many 20,000 square foot lots in El Segundo. No, I, I probably about 20 to 25 of them. And you live in one of those, right? <laughs> I'm in a townhouse <laughs> and I enjoy it. <laughs> Never that's home, good. so there's nothing yeah. to... No, it's funny. I, I live in a single family, 1,410 square foot, original beach, Redondo Beach sort of cottage thingy. I love it. Small and I can navigate it. And I, I couldn't imagine myself, even with whatever financial means I had living in this ginormous 5,000 square foot home with, you know, three stories or two. I, I don't know. It's a, I, I never grew up that way. So it's like people who want to move to PV and all that. That's just a different personality. I'd rather be in a big complex with a lot of people. Some people want to be in Palos Verdes where their neighbors, you know, an acre away. And again, just different personalities. Well, so speaking of that, I mean, how cool is the South Bay when you think about from El Segundo to PV? Rolling Hills, you can buy 10 acres of land and live in basically Carmel, California of LA County. You know, in terms of like top of the hill gated, huge acreage, you know, unbelievable surroundings, right? You got, you got that to two miles away, you can live in the best stretch of beach in the world on the strand of Manhattan Beach. Exactly. It's just like the variety of real estate and lifestyles in this short area, South Bay, is is crazy. And we're spoiled. And I don't travel much. And I always tell people, I've barely been to Redondo Beach Pier maybe five times in the last 10 years. I'd rather start exploring the South Bay before I start going to uh, other states, let alone other countries. And there's still a lot to explore, right? It's changing all the time. Correct. So being an El Segundo native... I know you're very involved in the community. What are you involved with? Tell us, our audience, about that. Chamber of Commerce, the Kiwanis Club, the Moose Lodge, the, uh, several of the sponsorships that are coming up yearly. You know, right now we have the 4th of July, which is probably one of the biggest events in El Segundo. And then we have the Camp Out Weekend, which is where the, the families can camp out at Rec Park for, for one night. And that's one of my favorite sponsorships, which is... Slash advertising weekend. That's great. You know. Is that the baseball fields there? Exactly. My son, we just had a tournament and we got to play there a couple months ago and I was blown away how, how nice that facility is compared to other cities. Exactly. It's 19 acres and it's just, it's always well maintained. And there's, there's ground keepers. Like we, we normally have to prep the field wherever we go. The dads have to chip in and like rake and do this and paint the lines. You guys had groundskeepers, golf carts with... This and that, it was like, it was, it was MLB. 
Right. Little League. It, yeah, it was a, <laughs> uh, it's a very well-run city, and the Parks and Recs Department is just outstanding, even from the street maintenance to the city employees and you know just a lot of uh, effort there. And then when you look at the police and fire, we have a very high percentage of them living in the city, which is unusual. And when you have a city manager who grew up in El Segundo and is uh, now the city manager, that's rare. What do you think is the most undervalued area? It could be adjacent to South Bay. Is it, you know, with Inglewood, is it like El Segundo was, was a prime opportunity seven years ago? You've doubled your money in seven years. Is, is that now Lawndale? Is that Hawthorne? Is that Westchester? Or is that overplay? You like, know what I'm really impressed with is the city of Lamita seems to be. Lamita, a, yeah, yeah. A lot of people are moving there. It's kind of like a starter home, very small community. I just got a listing there about a week and a half ago, and the neighbors are incredibly friendly. It's funny because it's a, not an incorporated city, mm-hmm. but it's a, a very tight city. What does that mean, actually, non-incorporated? I don't even know. So, like, that uh, uh, like Westchester is the city of L.A., okay. but already is the city of L.A. El Segundo, Man Beach, Hermosa Beach are, are their own cities. Gotcha. Okay. I never knew what that meant, unincorporated. So Great. now I know. So let's talk about some closing thoughts. Let's have a little fun before we close out the show. Okay. If you could have one superpower, what would it be? Well, healing cancer would be the most logical and most obvious and the one I think is the most important. That's a good one. Tell our audience something about you that they might be surprised to hear. That I actually like this job? <laughs> I <don't know>. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, damn, I got to sell real estate again this year? Another, another year? That's good. I think you're probably in rare company where, you know, that people do what they have to do because they have to do it. But to actually enjoy it is a whole other thing entirely. Oh, absolutely. I go back to like, I can candidly say probably 98% of the job, I love it. And probably the 2% of the job is so rare, it doesn't even, doesn't even amount to anything. Well, I think it's more like the opposite for most jobs. And they're, you know, eight to five. And I look forward to the weekend. I, I want to enjoy, you know, every, every day to me is a Monday and every night to me is a Friday. So enjoy every evening, work every day. Yeah, that's great. And I meant to ask you this, and I forgot. So man, another real estate question. We hear some crazy stories about realtors, like in their, you know, in their journey, like, during an open house, they, they walked in on this, or did they, never guess what happened to me here. Do you have an embarrassing, crazy story like that's just in all your years? God, there's so many. I'm trying to remember the, the, <laughs> the humorous ones. I've been at a listing appointment where I was actually at the wrong property, and they didn't know why I was there, but they were cordial to me, and I told them how much their house was worth, everything else, and at the very end, they said, did my husband call you? <laughs> was, uh, I was actually off by two digits, so on their oh, that's house. That's hilarious. But that was like 10 years ago. It stuck in my head, and they were, they were absolutely very and friendly you, to me. And you probably got the listing when it sold again, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That, that's how we met. Yeah. That's hilarious. What's your favorite word? Probably correct. I like using that word versus saying yes or yeah. I like that. Do you have a favorite vacation spot? The last time I really took a vacation was uh, to Guaymas, Mexico, which was a sister city of El Segundo about 14 years ago. So oh, wow. in reality, is I say this with truthfulness, being in El Segundo, it's a psychic vacation. You, where else do you get to work and see everyone you know? Decide you know, where you're going to eat that day and have a little more freedom when you're going to have lunch, when you're not going to have lunch. And who are you going to run into? Who are you going to run into? Yeah. I mean, it's absolutely you know, a different yeah. day every day, on a positive level, obviously. But I do stress to people going to real estate, I don't want to make this sound like an easy job. When you have 15 lease- listings, you have 15 bosses. You are not the boss. And, and I, I think keeping your feet on the ground about that is number one. They ask you what to do and you accommodate. It's not, it's not your show, it's their show. That's great. That's powerful. It's all about them. And that's in marketing, it's, that's a real good lesson for, for everybody that I, I preach. You know, it's, it's not about you. It's about them and how you can solve people's needs and, and how you go about doing that. And the money comes after. Don't focus on the money. You're going to make decisions about getting the listing based on money rather than just, hey, how can I accommodate the buyer and the seller, make them both happy and keeping it above board. This has been awesome. Do you have any closing thoughts or have we hit it? No, I think it's great. I think your magazine is outstanding. You skyrocketed to, you know, to be on the front of everyone's mind when you're thinking about marketing and advertising. Thank you very much. That's always been the dream and the goal. And so I'm humbly you, you accepting <laughs> your, your praise. And we continue to fight the good fight and take nothing for granted and keep trying hard. So I want to thank you again for your precious time, Bill. Keep up the good work. Keep selling those huge, crazy numbers and making Remax very proud of you to have on their roster, on their team. 
We'll always be loyal to him. That was one of the first people they ever hired without experience. They always had realtors with 10 or 15 years on. So I was very fortunate, you know, that small window in time, they, they took me on. It was great. Awesome. Well, thanks again. And we'll do this again soon. Great. I appreciate you having me over. Awesome. And that wraps up this episode. Thank you for tuning in, and we hope you found some value. Please share, subscribe, and leave a review. Find us on iTunes and your favorite podcast provider. Until next time.